All right, so we've got quicksort. We've just analyzed just conceptually what its best case and worst case must be based on arguments that depend on, on, the, on the depth of a recursion tree. And we know that best case happens when the partition function can split the array exactly in half every single time. And the worst case happens when the partition function splits the array as unequally as possible every single time. So, you know, if we've got a best case of n log n and a worst case of n squared, the question is, should we really use this thing, right? What, what, can, we, what can we do to determine whether or not this is a good algorithm? Well, let's, let's play with it just a little bit. Before we really fundamentally answer this question, let's try to figure out a little bit about what would generate this worst case uh, performance. So one thing I like to do uh, when I'm trying out a new sorting algorithm is I like to plug in a couple different kinds of arrays. And one really interesting array to give a sorting algorithm is one that's, re that's sorted in exactly reverse order. So in principle, if you know that an array is sorted in reverse order, you should be able to sort it uh, very quickly, right? All you have to do is reverse the indexing, which at worst is a, is a linear time operation. And, and then you're, you're done, right? Uh, depending on your architecture, you may be able to do it much faster than that. Um, and so, so, the, uh, so let's, let's think about what a reverse, a reverse sorted uh, quick sort would look like. All right, so let's, let's just, just for simplicity, let's just do this. We have eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So that's, that's, our, that's, our, uh, that's, our, that's our input array. So how, how does quicksort handle this input array? Well, let's just assume that we're using the Hoare partition. So in all of this, the Hoare partition with lazy pivot selection, right? So pivot selection is just gonna find the first element in the array and call that the pivot, and then try to figure out where that element goes. All right, so with, and I'm, I'm just calling this lazy, lazy pivot. Okay, so we're not trying to do anything sophisticated to select our pivots. We're just, just picking the first element. So that means the first element here is, is eight. So, so eight is our pivot. And so now conceptually, what the whore partition will do is it'll go find the place where eight belongs. Okay, and then what essentially it will, it will swap the location of where eight belongs with whatever is is where eight is, and so and so here's you know just one kind of talk through how this is how this works. So it says we've got eight. So now I'm going to initialize a counter here, and I'll initialize a counter here, and I'll have the counters walk towards each other, looking for stuff that doesn't belong. Okay, and so so uh, so here's here's how it goes, right? What what does it mean for the first counter to find something that doesn't belong? Well, it means to find something that's larger than or equal to eight. So the first counter is gonna go all the way, it's gonna go all the way to the end, right? It'll actually never find something that doesn't belong. It'll, it'll, everything it finds is gonna be strictly less than eight. The right counter, on the other hand, is trying to find something that's less than or equal to eight, and it, it immediately sees something less than or equal to eight, right? The, the first thing that it's initialized on is less than or equal to eight. And so now here we are at the end. Uh, we've, we've hit a place where both counters have found what they're looking for. And we ask, are, they, are the counters separated from each other or are they overlapping? And they're overlapping. And so that means that we, that means that we swap the eight, right? We swap the pivot with this element and then, and then we, we return. Okay, so, so after, the first, after the first operation of the whore partition, what we have is one, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and then eight. And, and quicksort now knows that that's where eight belongs. So quicksort's not gonna deal with eight anymore, but it's gonna go sort the rest of it, All right? So then the next call is, is gonna be quicksort on this first seven element array. So what do we see? Right, let's pause in our thinking about this before we do the next step and, and think about whether this is good or bad. And what we see is that if the array is sorted in reverse order and we're using the particular partitioning rules that I have here, then the first split is a bad split. Okay, the first split is a maximally uh, imbalanced split. Okay, so this is not a good sign. Right, this, is, this, is a, this is a bad split. Why is it a bad split? Because it because it it uh, it saves a huge amount of work for the next time, right? It saves the seven element array for the next time, and the only thing we did in that whole entire pass 
was determine the location of one element, right? That's the only kind of progress we made towards our goal. Well, maybe maybe we're going to be okay, you know, in the next the next iteration. So let's think about what the next iteration does. So here's our pivot, right? So this is this is a this is pivot. We start our i counter here, we start our j counter here, and then we have them walk towards each other uh, until they find things that don't belong. So now, what does it mean to not belong? Well, uh, for i, it means to find something that is larger than or equal to the pivot, and i is initialized on something larger than or equal to the pivot. Okay, so i stays where it is. i is already paused immediately, and then the j counter just walks down. Okay, it walks all the way down. It's and remember the j counter is looking for something less than or equal to the pivot. So it's going to walk all the way down, and it's going to pass i and land on the pivot itself, right? Because the pivot is less than or equal to the pivot, right? Because it's equal to the pivot. So you know the j counter stopped on the pivot. They, it's crossed the i counter, so that means we're done. But it just you know now we have to identify what what to do next. Um, and what we do next is we swap the pivot with j, but pivot's already in j, so so we're done. We just we just all we just did was verify, right? We just spent linear effort to verify that the pivot was in the right place, right? Which is not particularly efficient, right? It would have been nice if we just if we just somehow knew that the pivot was in the right place and didn't have to waste all that effort verifying. So now after our second iteration, we have the following. We have one, which has now been identified to be in the right place. We have eight that's been identified, it's been moved and identified to be in the right place. And then we have seven, six, five, four, three, two, okay? That's not good. So why is that not good? Because we just, we just went through two iterations of quicksort and we landed on what? We landed on an array, right? What is the, the work that is remaining to do is to sort an array that's already sorted in reverse order, right? So this is, this is in reverse order, which means we can, we can argue that the same exact thing is going to happen again and again and again until this is done, right? What is, what is quicksort going to do with, a, with a, a sort, an array that's sorted in reverse order? Well, it's going to take the thing at the beginning and throw it to the end and swap it with the thing at the end. And then it's just going to waste a step checking to make sure that the thing at the beginning is now in the right place, and then it's going to it's going to uh, do that again, right? Then it so so the next thing that'll happen is it'll take the seven, swap it with the two, and then you know just waste an entire iteration checking that the two is in the right place, and and it'll continue. And so we'll just get this same thing where each iteration we only reduce the size of the array by one. So this is a worst case input. Worst case input. Okay. Right, and so we might think we might think, all right, we just we just picked an array that was sorted in reverse order, which is kind of like the worst sorting you can get. It kind of, right? Kind of. Uh, so maybe it was because it was in reverse order that this this gave us a worst case input. That you know that that quick sort shrunk the size of the array by one every single time. So what if we just tried something different? What if we what if we said uh, instead of uh, instead of looking at a reverse sorted array let's just think about what's the what's the nicest input you could possibly give to a sorting algorithm well it's a it's a f a, f a correctly sorted array so what if so, so how does quick sort work on a sorted array right we know that quick sort uh, we know that quick sort is has worst case performance on a reverse sorted array so let's give it a sorted array. Let's just try to, you know, naively make make it as easy for quick sort as possible and see what it see what we get. So we'll just give it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And now let's think about how quick sort would operate on this thing. So quick sort uh, selects its pivot here. Again, we'll just use the same the same parameters. Uh, lazy pivot selection with the hor partition. So pivot. Uh, is selected to be uh, the first element with a value of one, and then the i counter is looking for something larger than or equal to the pivot, so it stops immediately. Right there, it found something larger than or equal to. The j counter is looking for something less than or equal to, so it walks all the way down, all the way down, looking at every single element until it finds the pivot itself, and then it says, "Aha! I've I've found something that's less than or equal to the pivot, so I'll stop." Then what do we do? Well, the the pivot is on element j so we just we just let we just uh we just continue right we just say ah the pivot's in the right place right what did we just do we just verified 
that the pivot was in the right place already. Okay, and so so now we say, all right, now we'll go sort the rest of it. So what do we have? Well, now we have one in the right place, you know, verified to be in the right place. Oops. And now we have to go sort that array. What is that array? That array is a, an array that's in that's, that is already sorted. We just showed that the first thing quick sort does on an array that is already sorted is it checks to see that the first element is in the right place using linear effort, and then it goes to and then it goes to deal with the rest of the array. Okay. So what is this? This is bad, right? This is a worst case input because what's going to happen is we'll see you know now after the second step we have one and two that will both have been verified to be in the right place, and then we'll have three. Four, five, six, seven, eight remaining to, to process, and this is exactly this is exactly what we were hoping to avoid uh, in the, in uh, in quick sort, right? So this is also worst case, also worst case. In other words, big theta of n squared. So that's that's a that that might feel a little bit depressing, right? That if we give the array. If we give the algorithm arrays that are easy to sort, the algorithm takes n squared effort to either sort them, right? Which, which in the case of the reverse sorted array, which just means flip it left to right, uh, or uh, or uh, check to see that it's sorted, costs n squared effort. Um, and so, so this this feels a little bit this feels a little bit negative. Uh, uh, for, for quick sort. So what, how are we going to deal with this? Well, that, that'll be the subject of the next video. Um, how do we actually think about complexity when we have, when we have these potentially negative results here?